We are live. Hello, everybody out there for this broadcast. I am Wendy Green, and this is the third episode of Hey Boomer. Hey Boomer is a place where we start meaningful conversations using stories told by my guests that have been very impactful in their lives. And a conversation can start today with you leaving comments in the, in the comment box, or it can start later. If you find this meaningful, you can share it with a friend and then you can start a conversation with them. But before I introduce my guest, I just want to give you an idea and an update of what's been going on with Hey Boomer. I am so grateful for all of the interest and support that this broadcast seems to have generated. There seems to be a hunger for conversation, for the sharing of ideas and the building of understanding. We all have stories to share. And so please let me know if you're interested in being a guest on the show, message me and I will reach out to you. And please leave your comments, questions or thoughts in the comment box throughout the broadcast. And I'd love to see who's out there now. So if you just feel like leaving us a quick note and letting us know you're there, that would be amazing. I am really looking forward to my conversation with my guest, Joni Adrian Craft. Joni and I met about seven years ago when we both worked for a company called iJet International. Joni and I became good friends. I used to stay at her house when I was in Annapolis. We also both went through a coaching certification program together. And so we've had some very long, intimate conversations and have shared things with each other that, you know, you probably don't share with everybody. Um, I moved away, and so unfortunately, we don't get to see much of each other. And so I am really happy to be able to see her today and share her with you. And then at the end of the conversation, we're going to share a video with you, and we'll tell you more about that later. So Joni went to Georgetown University, where she got a master's degree in Latin American studies, she was hired by the Central Intelligence Agency to work in the Latin American Division of the Directorate of Operations. During her 33-year career, Joni had permanent assignments in eight different countries, including Peru, Russia, Switzerland, Uruguay, Denmark, the United Kingdom, Mexico, and Afghanistan. She was, an induct she was inducted into the Senior Intelligence Services rank in 2009, and her final assignment was as director of the CIA's Mid-Career Training Center. She was awarded 17 Exceptional Performance Awards over the years, a meritorious unit citation for her work with the Counterterrorism Division in Afghanistan, and the Career Intelligence Medal on her retirement. Joni then moved to the private sector as the director of analytic personnel with iJet International, which is where we met. And she was managing, mentoring, and training over 30 intelligence analysts. Joni became the company's representative to present on female travel safety, and she now consults on this topic. Joni lives in Annapolis, Maryland with her husband, Bill, and she enjoys volunteering at the local hospital, exercising, gardening, walking her dog, and paddling with the Annapolis Dragon Boat Club. Joni, thank you so much for agreeing to be my guest today on Hey Boomer. Thanks, Wendy. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I, yeah, Wendy and I went through a nine-month um, professional coaching. You know, it, was, it was a fairly intense nine months uh, while we were working full-time. And I think ultimately we ended up using the coaching techniques on each other more than, <laughs> more than <laughs> we work on each other. So that was good. Um, so yeah, I, um, I I sometimes don't recognize myself when I hear my bio, um, but it was at the end of the day, it was such a short 33 years and it went by so fast and it was so wonderful. All of the places that I got to live and um, you can imagine I have a lot of stories. Um, 
some of which I can't tell. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. I, you and know, I know. a lot of exciting stories. I live some wonderful places. Uh, but really, the thing that had the most impact on my life was the diagnosis of, of breast cancer and uh, the time that it took me to recover and get through it and the lessons learned from that experience. Um, oh, and sorry, Johnny, I am just grateful to you. I know you have so many stories to tell. So I, I I'm going to give you the screen, let you go through this story, and I may interrupt with a question or two. Okay, great. So um, today is particularly poignant. Um, and I don't know what it is, but things seem to happen in my life for a reason. Um, whether it's karma, whether it's the universe, whether it's you know God, whatever you might believe in. But I do feel kind of a, a spiritual presence. And in this regard, with this podcast that Wendy asked me to do, gosh, weeks ago, um, I told her that I, I was caring for a dear friend, a Dragon Boat uh, teammate, 47 years old, and I was one of several you know, wonderful caregivers for her um, as she was battling metastatic cancer. And Bridget passed away yesterday. So, and I'm gonna keep it together, but I just think I wanted to start that off, um, my discussion about breast cancer um, with the fact that it, it affects so many of us and all ages, um, you know, she has two young children. And so this is not gonna be about Bridget, but I, I did want to shout out to her and um, we'll talk more about her later. So in terms of my story, uh, I was living in Denmark. Uh, I was 39 years old, uh, two children. Allie was 12 and Drew was eight. Uh, I was living with my ex-husband, um, who was also in with the agency. And we had a beautiful house and life in Denmark. And in about May or June of 1996, um, I found a lump myself right above my collarbone. And I thought, oh, boy, this isn't good. So um, I had the embassy was wonderful and found a doctor. I went in, uh, had the lump removed. It was actually a little bit of a sketchy doctor's office, honestly. I thought, what, you're gonna do a lumpectomy right here, right now without, like, okay. Um, so they took it out and it came back as a lipoma. So good to go, not, not cancerous, nothing benign. Went home, it was great, um, excited. We were planning a trip with Michael's uh, parents to come and go to Italy. We had rented a beautiful house in Siena for two weeks, not until October of that year. Uh, so I thought, good, you know, there's not gonna be any complications. And about September, I felt it coming back. And I, I knew instinctively that um, this was not good. So I uh, went in for actually a sonogram because it didn't show up on the mammogram. That was a lesson right there, um, even though it was a large lump by the time it was discovered. Sonogram, son I had run, this is another point. I mean, I felt so great. I had run a 10K the day before I went in for the sonogram and they said, yes, it looks very suspicious. So I came home, I guess I'm drawing this out, but. Anyway, I came home because it's in my mind like yesterday, called my uh, GYN in the States, who I had a very good relationship with. And I said, Dr. Amorosi, um, do you think I should go on this trip or should I deal with this immediately and, and postpone going to Siena in the house? And he said, no, go ahead. You know, two weeks is not going to make a big difference. So, so we did. Um, we had a lovely trip two weeks in this wonderful farmhouse in Siena. Um, of course, you can imagine my mind was not completely there. Um, I was very preoccupied with the lump in my chest. Got back from Siena and the embassy had arranged for me to go to London to have another biopsy. So Michael and I, we got back from Siena a weekend. In October, I left with Michael to London 
The embassy had arranged for me to get a biopsy that evening. Uh, the doctor actually opened his office. So it was another kind of surreal doctor experience. Um, there was nobody in the office and it was kind of dark. And I mean, he did the biopsy right there. Again, that was not fun. Um, got through that and the next morning he called and said, yes, it's, uh, it's cancer. I can't stage it, but it's definitely cancer. So thank God the embassy again stepped up, um, got me on a plane later. Well, actually the next morning, Michael went back to Denmark to take care of the kids. And I went to stay with my sister in McLean, Virginia. That was a Thursday. See, I can remember <laughs> every day. Um, that Thursday I got to Virginia. I had a call from the health office at the agency saying we've arranged for you to have a mastectomy. I'm like, okay, if that's, <laughs> nobody really talked to me about it, but okay. Um, and it's gonna be on Monday, November 1st with Dr. Potter at Georgetown. I'm like, okay, there we go. So I went in um, November 1st, it was a Monday, Dr. Potter did a full mastectomy. There was really no discussion about alternatives, but, um, and there was certainly no discussion. He was an older gentleman, old time physician, uh, no discussion about reconstruction. So I didn't know to ask. So there you have it. I had a mastectomy, great, it's gone. So now I had to wait. And that I think if you ask any cancer patients or any patients that are waiting for results, that's often the most difficult and trying time. Um, trying to sleep and not knowing, was it stage one? Was it, you know, what was it? So finally, after about 10 days, um, I had a call from Dr. Potter's office asking me to come in. So I thought, oh, okay, well, they don't want to tell me on the phone, so I guess it's not good. Went in, uh, he said it was uh, late stage three, stage four cancer because the, the mass was so large and 20, he had taken out 20 of my lymph nodes and a lot of them were positive. So now, okay, faced with that, trying to get, you know, get wrap my mind around that. And then you have to think about, well, what do I do about it? What's the, um, you know, what are my alternatives for treatment? And I didn't know, um, God, I didn't even know what a mastectomy was when I walked in to Georgetown that morning, barely. Uh, so I started to do some research and this is where um, friends came in. Uh, we had an ambassador in Denmark who was a dear friend and he, through his contacts, he was a, a well-to-do man in New York, a political appointee. He, um, long story, he was a friend of Evelyn Lauders who uh, had breast cancer and her doctor, Larry Norton at Sloan Kettering is probably the world renowned doctor for breast cancer. The ambassador arranged for me um, to meet with Larry Norton. Uh, and the only hitch was he was traveling um, and he was going off on some foreign trip, but he happened to be coming through Reagan National Airport. And he would meet with me in the waiting room at the airport between his flights. So crazy, I mean, how things happen. So here I am, I'm lugging all of my you know, uh, results and my pictures and um, found him. This is before cell phones, mind you. I found him in the waiting room uh, he sat down with me and he shuffled through all of my paperwork and told me, yes, uh, just based on looking at this, you need to have high dose chemotherapy. And one option uh, would be a stem cell transplant. Well, you know, I won't use four letter words, but I'm like, oh, stem cell transplant. Okay. WTF. What is that? So um I go home and do a little bit of research and talk to some people. And as luck would have it, my sister's best friend, her husband had recently had a stem cell transplant with a fabulous doctor at Fairfax. So she, through her, we arranged to meet with Dr. Beveridge. And this is all happening in like 
I think I went from drove from Dr. Potter's office to Dr. Beveridge. I don't know, but it was all happening very quickly. And Dr. Beveridge was very reassuring and said, yes, I think a stem cell transplant's um, what we should do. I said, okay. Um, you know, it was a radical treatment and they don't even do it back then. Um, I mean, they, they don't even do it now. And back then it was considered fairly radical uh, because there was a lot of prep work. Um, so I had, first I had a round of chemotherapy uh, to kind of, um, you know, preemptive. Then I had um, what's installed a, a big port. Um, they called it the garden hose because that's kind of what it was. And they siphoned, I went in once a week and they siphoned my blood and they spun it down. I'm getting into a lot of graphic detail here. I'm sorry, but um, it kind of adds to the story. So they spun my blood down, cleaned it um, and froze it. And then I went into the hospital uh, for what was going to be a month. I knew that. So I went in. Um, the very first day, I got my round of high-dose chemotherapy. It was around the clock for 24 hours uh, for three days. So essentially what that did was kill off every like white cell, red cell, cancer cell, hair cell, stomach lining. I mean, everything. Um, all of my counts went down to basically zero. So they let that percolate for a while. And then finally, uh, they come back in. When they say you, you've almost reached ground zero, they come back in. And meanwhile, during this time, I am in isolation. So it's it's very um, poignant today as well, uh, because I was so uh, susceptible to infection. Um, so I was in isolation. The kids did come at one point with masks and uh, so anyway, everything dropped down to zero and then they reinfused me with my stem cells. And it's pretty spectacular that within 20 minutes, they said, um, my all of my accounts started coming up. And I was in the hospital um, you know, another couple of weeks to get my strength back. I lost, had lost 20 pounds and uh, got out and had radiation. And here I am. Knock on wood. Um, but it was a long haul. And I think people say, well, why, why did you take such a radical approach? And I thought, you know, looking at my children, I remember telling Dr. Beveridge, I just want to um, see my kids graduate from high school. Or I just want to see Drew play in a, a high school or a middle school basketball game. Or, you know, it was all about my kids. Um, and so I said, give me everything you got. So I don't, I wouldn't be able to look back and say, gosh, I wish I had done that, or I wish I had done that. Just give me everything in the book, and then we'll go from there. And here I am. And we are so glad. Wow, what a story, Joni. Um, so t talk to me a little bit about, um, well, first of all, you said your kid, how long before your kids got to come back from Denmark and be with you? They came back, um, in about May of that year. So they finished out their school year um, that that spring of 1996, they, they finished out, 96, yeah. So as you were going through all of this, the meetings with the doctors and all, were you by yourself? Did your family sister. with you? I was with my sister and God bless her. Um, we have a lot of, of memories of those days. Um, because oftentimes things strike you funny and you end up just laughing at the most inappropriate times, <laughs> you know, buying a wig and we're both like in hysterics on the ground. Um, but times like that, and I had times like that with Bridget, which I treasure. So, Yeah, sometimes they say laughter is the best medicine, right? Yeah, yeah. so you've certainly been through it. But then you told me that there are a couple of things that you learn from this that your kids even quote you on. Oh yeah. You want to um, you want to share with those? Yeah, I, have, I have a couple of um, mantras that I live by, and I think they've gotten even stronger since my diagnosis with cancer. Um, and certainly the first one is, um, and I tell my kids if they call me and they have some problem, I say, whoa, 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 whoa. If it's not life threatening, I basically don't want to hear about it. It's not a problem, you know. And that's that's my mantra. And my mother was that way too. She was, God rest her. So she was um, the glass half full, 
it's not a problem. It's we're not going to die. Nobody's going to die. So um, as long as you can say that. And my other um, my other thing I live by, and and this was actually before my diagnosis, was that you know do one nice thing a day. It, it doesn't take anything to even if it's holding a door for somebody or particularly in today's environment, do one nice thing um, and it'll come back to you. And I tell my kids that all the time and, and they, they will tell me, mom, I did a good thing today. <laughs> They're 30 <laughs> years old <laughs> and 32 years old. But I think that has stuck with them. Um, and they both are wonderful. My daughter's a nurse and my son is a mental skills coach. So that's awesome. That is Thanks. Yeah. Takes after his mama, huh? They're doing good things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're both they're both good kids and caregivers, and they kind of got that from you, I think. I think so. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, there was something else that you had mentioned in in one of our conversations that I learned in coaching, but that you seem to have learned before that, and that was about the three good things. Remember talking about that, where you were like, you know, I try to write down three. Yes. Good so that that um, that goes to some of my coping skills when I was going through cancer, and and even today when things get hard, um, I I did several things. Um, I don't know if there are any cancer patients or people that are caregivers to to ill people at the moment, but um, three things that really helped me through is. Always exercise. Um, I've always exercised, and even on my worst day of chemo, you know, I would go out and walk around the block. Or we lived across from a um, a middle school, and there was a little park behind it, and I would go out and kind of try and draw strength from the big trees, you know, and walk around. Um, but exercise certainly has always been a uh, part of my life, and I think that's important. Um, another thing that uh, I didn't realize and I wasn't very good at before my diagnosis was accepting help from people and asking for help. Um, Bridget in the end got very good at that. And it was as much a gift to me and to her caregivers um, as it was the help for her. But she told us, you know, I need this. I need this. I need you to take, take my kids here. I need to go to this appointment. And that was a gift to me because it allowed the caregiver to have some concrete actions to do, to feel like they're helping. So accepting help, asking for help um, is a real lesson there. And I was never very good at it. And I remember leaving the hospital and I had a grocery sack full of get well cards. And I looked at it and I thought, wow, are there that many people that care about me? You know, I, it never occurred to me that I had that big of a community support and that's wonderful. So find a community of support. And mine today, um, I have to put a big shout out to the Dragon Boat uh, Club. Uh, we are a group of, of women, mostly breast cancer, but also supporters. Uh, the club was founded just 10 years ago by a breast cancer survivor himself. Um, it was a man, a restaurant owner in Annapolis, Mike McGarvey. He founded, he said he wanted to give back to the community somehow. And he thought this was a great opportunity because he had read that dragon boating is good for uh, lymphedema and certainly the support of all of the, the women in the group. I mean, talk about a community um, and we're all seem to be givers and um, you can't ask for a better support group. And we get out on the water three times a week and paddle hard and um, and we all took care of Bridget and love Bridget so much. Um, so, uh, and that, that knocks off two things right there. It's exercise and a community. <laughs> so you, so it's wonderful. And my ladies on the Dragon Boat Club are like my sisters. And the men. <laughs> there are <Wow>. large suppers. <laughs> yeah, there are men that get breast cancer. I didn't know that until exactly. probably 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah. And and I think the thing that we learned in coaching that I guess you knew before was that um, 
you know, to every day think of three good things right. that yeah, you I can be grateful for. And I, and I love some of your examples. And I'm wondering, yeah, like right now you're going through this great sense of grief and loss with Bridget. And how do you do that when you're going through that? You no, know, I am. Um, I did when I was going through cancer. I at night I would journaling was another thing that got me through. Um, I have books, those um, marble black marble old you know books that my kids had and I probably took them um I have about four of those that I journaled through my breast cancer and at night I would write down three things that were troubling me and I'd scratch them out and then I would write down three things um that I was thankful for and that's how I would go to sleep is trying to think of those three things that I'm so thankful for um, and that helps, that helps a lot because there's so much to be thankful for. Um, it does. And it's hard sometimes when you're feeling bad to think of those things. And I know I started uh, doing that at the beginning of this year again mm -hmm. and filling it up every night. It's by my bed and it's, right. you know, I mean, it could just be that we have heat on, you know, or we have lights on. It doesn't have to be big, major things. Right. I know. A funny story. Um, I'm going to tell on my son at Thanksgiving, the family, my family, we always went around the table and asked what we were um, or said what we were thankful for. And um, the story of my family is that Drew um, said he was about, I don't know, six or something, said, I'm thankful for popsicles. <laughs> and my, and my, my daughter was thankful for shopping malls. Right. <laughs> Right. So it doesn't matter what it is you're thankful for. <laughs> well, before we show this video, Joni, yeah. that you shared with me, can you just kind of tell us a little bit about it? Maybe a little bit yeah. about Bridget um, because we want to honor her with this. Yeah, I'm, I feel Bridget so much um, with me right now. And I saw her, the last time I saw her was, I'm going to try and hold it together here. Last time I saw her was Thursday. Um, she was in bed and she looked beautiful and she had just seen her kids and she, I was holding her hand and, she, and she said, Joni, you know, I don't have very long. I said, I know bridge, you know, God, but you have been such a, a battle. You have been such, you know, an incredible fighter. I said, and you know what I have a vision of is that you're uh, when you close your eyes and um, you move out into your next life, a big dragon boat's gonna come and pick you up. And there's gonna be all of those loved ones that have gone before you in the dragon boat and they're gonna take you to a beautiful river. And she said, that's that's such a beautiful vision. Thank you for that. So I, I feel good that I left her with a little something. Um, and I said, I wanted to bring you a river rock to put in your hand to hold on to. And she said, oh no, I have river rocks right there. So I think she, she had that kind of, um, spirituality um, herself, which I think helped her. Uh, but she was, uh, she went incredibly smart. Uh, she went to Stanford. She played, um, she, while going to Stanford, she went through Navy, um, o not OCS, but the ROTC course. And she had to go from Stanford um, to another college, I can't remember, Berkeley, I think, at like 5 a.m., three days a week to do that. And I mean, she was just super accomplished, super smart, um, beautiful uh, tennis player. She got a scholarship to play tennis, so fit, um, two beautiful children. She was in the Navy. Um, she retired when she was diagnosed in Charleston um, about six years ago. I might get that wrong, but um, so she retired and she was working as a civilian at the Naval Academy. Um, but her kids were always like paramount in her world and they were they're beautiful two little children eight and ten I think Reed and Clara um, and she, she was a great dragon boater <laughs> she did fall off one time we have a story where we were practicing for the Guinness um, so this video we're going to show is a uh, we decided we came up with the idea as a fundraiser to try and break a Guinness world record Actually, it was a record of our own making. We weren't breaking any record. We just said, okay, we're gonna uh, paddle um, 
a half marathon and we're going to try and get into the Guinness Book of World Records. So bless them. Uh, the, uh, I'm trying to remember who the Kirks, I think, did all of the background to get us into the book. And we did it. And we had, um, you'll see on the video how wonderful it was. And Bridget was a drummer for us. And in one of the practices, Bridget fell off. She was drunk and she completely fell off and we got the boat and somehow she popped back on. She just That was typical Bridget, like nothing had ever happened. You know, she was, she was just that way. I have so many funny stories of her, but I won't. All right, so this is uh, a new experience to see how I'm gonna share the screen and show this video. So hopefully this all works for us. Okay. Okay. Second. Wendy. Yes, don't go away. Okay, I won't go away. Okay. Cry. There I'm we go. Here, probably. I know, I'll probably cry too. Okay, <laughs> here we go. All right. Looking up the hill, the climb is all that I can see, but I feel like you're underestimating me. I will not be added to a list of names that I you're doing great because it wasn't worth the pain. I got a fight inside, it needs to be let out. I see you placing your bets now. Which one put 50 bucks down? Two weeks to hit the ground. I've got a piece of me, I need to be set free. I've outgrown my wife's leg body. I'm not okay with giving up or giving in like I used to be. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I can do. With the weight of the world on my shoulders, I can't wait to show you. I already know you won't believe it till you see it. I'm a soldier, I'm a warrior. Taking my time, turning seconds into hours. I'm gonna find out how to turn this weakness into power. I see a light in the dark. I've heard that the hardest part of this. So you can knock me down, but the problem is I got a fight inside. It needs to be let out. I see you placing your bets now. Which one put 50 bucks down on two weeks to hit the ground? I've got a piece of me that needs to be set free. Without calling my wife for lack of Not okay with giving up or giving in like I used to be. Oh, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I can do. The weight of the world on my shoulders. I can't wait to show ya. I already know you won't believe it till you see it. I'm a soldier, I'm a warrior. Whoa. A sisterhood of unwilling, initiated by fire, poison, and knife, pushed to the limits of our endurance and back. We now share a boat, a river, a lifeline, creating a fierce and festive flotilla. 
we savor the synchrony of 20 paddles, clear steer, and deep drum. Never to be who we were, just reaching for more of who we can become. Oh, yeah. A daughter of one of our members um, wrote that, Becky Kinder, and it's she wrote it for us, and it's it's beautiful. Tremendous respect for all of you warriors. Thank you. Yeah, and love to Bridget and her family. Thanks, Wendy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Joni, for being here and all of your friends who joined us. You're welcome. Thanks for everything. I look forward to next week. What's on next week? Ah, thank you for asking who's up next week. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so who's up next week? My guest next week is Rob Hanley. Um, Rob has an interesting story. He's going to talk to us about what's behind door number two. <laughs> when door number one doesn't open the way you want it to open. Mm, interesting. Yeah, which we all have experienced that as well. Right. So we all have stories to tell. This has been the start of a great conversation. Thank you, Joni. And my name is Wendy Green, and this is Hey Boomer. Bye. Thanks.